Oh. Okay. <laughs> Each hemisphere. Yeah. Well, Morning. Chuck, I was on 285 stuck in traffic the other day around Sandy Spring where they're doing that big new interchange. Mm -hmm. And they had the big cut on the hillside right next to my car. And mm -hmm. so you gave me a Zen moment in my stop traffic <laughs> that I could just observe that hillside and see all of the rock cut. <laughs> the rock cut, right? <laughs> That's um, the Chattahoochee court site. So a continuing. Okay, we're at 930. Chuck has everybody riled up and warmed up for a great class. Uh, we ask everyone to stop their video and uh, we'll use the raise the hand function at the end. So Chuck, it's all yours. Can I share? Yes, you can share. Why is it not letting me? Oh, there we go. Good morning. How are you guys? Um, I thought I would talk about current events and I'm gonna make, even though it's about the war in Ukraine, I'm gonna make it about geology because um, why is Russia attacking Ukraine? Um, and it's because of geology that they're attacking Ukraine. They want the mineral wealth as well as the um, agricultural wealth and industrial wealth of Ukraine. So this is a geologic map of Ukraine. And um, there are, I've kind of changed the names here because they were written in Russian. Um, but there is a, um, luckily a translation underneath in English, but uh, basically, you know, like we talk about the terrains of Georgia, there are three terrains in Ukraine, the European platform terrain, the paleo Mesozoic terrain, which is sedimentary rocks, much like the sedimentary rocks in the Valley and Ridge, and then this um, Scythian terrain in the south that have all come together by plate tectonics. Um, there used to be a, a great seaway um, that the Mediterranean, Caspian, Black Sea are all remnants of it called the Tethy Sea that once separated Europe from Africa and India and Asia from India um, that has closed and been uplifted. And so that's where a lot of these things came from. Um, and there's a thing I found on Facebook that talked about the superlatives of Ukraine. And so these are what those are. And you can see that there's lots and lots of reasons or lots of mineral reasons why Ukraine is very important. Um, look at all these top tens and all these very critical different resources that Russia can utilize. Um, and Russia already probably has more natural resources than any other country in the world, just because it owns such a vast amount of land. Um, but it's much easier to get all these things out of Ukraine than out of Siberia. So that's, this shows you where you can find all these different um, minerals um, in Ukraine. Um, this is called the Ukrainian shield. And Shield makes me think that it's metamorphic terrain, and I did not realize that. That it's an old craton, an old core of a continent that is exposed and therefore has lots of mineral wealth in it, like northern Canada does. And this is a cross section across the Ukraine showing the stratigraphy, the layers, and that there's lots of oil and gas. Oil is these green little things and the gas are these um, red things. This is bedrock. There's salt deposits from that evaporating Tethy Sea, um, et cetera. So lots of mineral wealth. Um, and then the industrialization of Ukraine, another reason um, Russia wants it. It has, look at the things it builds, uh, rocket launchers, turbines for nuclear power plants. It has a great rail network. And of course, Ukraine is basically located between Russia and Europe. So everything that Russia building pipelines to Europe, et cetera, goes through the Ukraine. So why not just own the Ukraine? This is showing all the pipelines that go through Ukraine and into um, the rest of Russia, I'm sorry, the rest of Europe from Russia. 
Um, this is a soil map of the Ukraine. Um, Ukraine has some of the best agricultural soils on the planet. Um, you've heard of the black earth soils. Well, 25% of all black earth soils are in Ukraine. And that's what makes it such a rich agricultural land. And again, another reason to want to own Ukraine. Um, Russia needs food, um, not only to export to China to feed Chinese, but to feed themselves too. And so right next door is a breadbasket of Europe. So that's why um, Ukraine and why Russia has invaded Ukraine. And it's all about geology. Um, and that's going to be my next class. The last class um, next week is to um, present my evidence of why everything we do is based on geology. And one thing I will say back to um, the war that's going on between Russia and Ukraine is that um, I have a difficult time finding high ground for us since we just got out of two 20 year wars in the Middle East that there was no justification to be in. And the fact that, I don't know if y'all realize, but 65 cents of every dollar you pay in for taxes goes to something about war, either our, directly into our research and military, for our military to take care of the veterans of our military, et cetera. 65% of every tax dollar goes to that. Um, and we spend far more than the next 10 countries on the planet, and that includes China and Russia. Um, I'm, I'm kind of joyride here. I'm going to Puerto Rico in a couple of weeks um, to visit my nephew, who's I'm very proud of. He's living the, um, the great life. I mean, it, he can work from online, so it doesn't matter where he is. He's from New England. He was tired of New England winters, so he went to live in San Juan for the winter and is working um, from there online doing Zoom classes just as I am. Um, he's getting paid though. But anyway, um, I had noticed that there had been, I thought a lot of earthquakes in Puerto Rico. And then I looked into it and found out, oh no, this is just normal Puerto Rico. So this right here is telling you that in the last, at the time I did this, which was on the 20th, there were 23 earthquakes in the last 24 hours in the Puerto Rico area. And, and all of them were below four, so little earthquakes. And many of them were way out here in this trench. And this is the deepest trench in the Atlantic Ocean, and it's over 20,000 feet deep. And so it's a, so, uh, a mega thrust ball, just like the one in Cascadia and the one under Japan. And so there's lots of little movements on it. Um, I even looked at, okay, so there's, this thing gave me how many earthquakes in the last 24 hours, how many in the last seven days, last 30 days, and the last three year. And then I was seeing if the trend was it's getting more frequent earthquakes or less frequent, and it's both ways, actually. It's um, actually, this is above average for the each month, and this is above average for each year of that month, and this is above average for each day of this or about average for each day of this week. So it could be that, yeah, they are increasing in um, frequency, but it's hard to say when you have 3,000 a year. And that, that, I know there was a class where I, I, every, or a year that every class I talked about the number of earthquakes that had happened in the last week in California and Nevada. And I think people were amazed at how many there were earthquakes or incredibly common around the world. Um, so I wanted just to show you the different um, topographies of uh, Puerto Rico and karst is a topography that occurs in limestone terrains. And this is where the Arecibo um, radio telescope once was. And you can see how this terrain is just uh, a bunch of potholes without any connection. And that's what karst is. And I wanna to go to these forts at the entrance to San Juan. So that's enough about Puerto Rico and we'll actually go to class. Um, so this is a class is about the last 
part of Georgia, the older, oldest, if you will, part of Georgia. Um, and this orange line, and it, we called North America before it exited Pangea in the form that we know today, we call North America. But before this, it didn't look like what we see today. And we call that older continent, Laurentia. And Laurentia is named for those mountains in Canada, the Laurentia Mountains and the Grenville orogeny, one of the earliest upliftings of the Appalachian. And so back at the beginning of the Paleozoic, um, the beginning of the Cambrian, um, Georgia was really just this little piece and it was not above ground, it was a shelf. So it was off coast, but shallow sea. And there were lots of critters living on there. There was no land, um, life to say on land, no animals at all. And at the most lichens and, and fungi and things like that on the land. No trees, no grass, nothing like that. Um, and most of life in Georgia was just um, marine life. And of course, the Cambrian, we know it had every phylum uh, represented. So lots of different marine lives. And um, Laurentia, again, is this older continent that all these things collided with throughout the Paleozoic that we've talked about over the weeks of this class. Um, the cross section we talked about, this is that ancient continent, this red down here. These are sediments that were piled on that ancient continent. And to the east of here and south of here is this Blue Ridge th thrust fault that threw all these other rocks on top of these uh, Paleozoic sediments. Some of these rocks to the east, not to the south, but to the east are these same rocks, but they've been metamorphosed. So they got deeply buried and then got thrusted up and over the top of these rocks or these unmetamorphosed equivalents. And I don't know if that made sense or not, but if it didn't, well, I can explain it later. Um, I wanted to show you, there's a feature in this old Laurentia of Georgia that we call the Great Valley. And the Great Valley is truly a great valley because it extends across most of the United States. And this is um, a view of it. And it's the Ridge and Valley province or the Valley and Ridge province, it goes both ways. But the most Eastern part of that in Georgia is called the Great Valley. And it extends all the way up to Lake Champlain and back to Alabama. And it was a major thoroughfare for Native Americans and animals before them to get from the South to the North. And you can see we've had lots and lots of American history occur in the Ridge and Valley or Valley and Ridge province. Great battles like Saratoga and Chickamauga and other things in between. These are all kind of evidence of uh, everything we do is because of geology. Um, this is the stratigraphy of the Valley and Ridge. Um, so these are the oldest sediments um, out there and these underlie the Great Valley. <clears throat> um, and we'll see different photos later of some of these rocks and things. Um, so a sequence of what was happening was the Grenville Mountains were uplifted a billion years ago and they were eroding. And they were still eroding 500 million years ago at the beginning of the Cambrian. And these are the sediments that were coming into them. So um, luckily in the um, roadside geology of Georgia, uh, the authors have often written out what the source of these sedimentary rocks are uh, as to what kind of environment they were. So they're barrier islands and lagoons, just like we have on the sh shore today or the rocks were thrust vaulted up on top of them or beneath them. Um, it was a shallow cell, shelf of barrier islands again, tidal flats and back and forth. And that shows you that the sea was, you know, if you sped up time, the way waves lap a shoreline would um, correspond with the way seas would transgress and regress onto the continent. And these are due to various factors, one isostasy and the buoyancy of the continents, but also is there glaciation going on and therefore the sea would recede and it melting, it would um, transgress, or even just um, 
plate tectonics subducting a, a place or rifting apart and sinking a place that we've seen in some videos. So I just want to show you that we have studied the underlying rocks in the co in the valley and ridge, and we know what their sources are. When you finally get to uh, Cloudland Canyon, and th this painting behind me is my attempt at Cloudland Canyon, and these um, brown things that look like almost like uh, maybe hamburgers sticking out of the lettuce of this giant burger um, that I painted. Those are actually the sandstone cliffs of the crab orchard uh, formation and their deltaic sequence. So these is like the Mississippi Delta and these um, slopes between the cliffs are underlain by shales that would form um, you know, beyond the, um, the river's course. If you know anything about the Mississippi and Mississippi River and its delta, you know that when the Mississippi was untamed, it would overflow its banks and you know, spread out, depositing sand mostly along the closest to the river with clay further away, making the swamps and that shale becomes, is, comes from clay and actually, obviously, sandstone comes from the stone sand, and you get a lot of vegetation growing in those swamps. That's where the coal comes from. So these are the um, fossils that you can find in North Georgia. Uh, one of the major issues for playing and going and finding fossils in Georgia is that. There are very few places that it's allowed that aren't on either private property or public property. And you would think, well, public property, then we should be able to do that. But most of the public property is either a state park or a national park of some sort where that kind of thing is um, strictly forbidden. So um, there are times where big groups will contact um, property owners and ask permission to come on their property to dig up fossils and will be allowed. Um, I haven't tried to do that for us um, and probably won't just because it um, sounds nearly impossible. How do we all get there together and not have, you know, a cavalcade of, uh, you know, 50 cars pulling up at somebody's house to go dig in their yard. But anyway, um, this is Georgia's oldest fossil. So it's basically an ancient cup, you know, so um, a filter feeding organism of some sort that would filter the water through itself and filter out any nutrients that it could get. Um, most people know about trilobites, these ancient cockroaches of the sea, and they went extinct long ago, but at one time they were one of the major fossil or major organisms that you find and therefore the major fossils you can find. Um, corals, we know that eventually they came, arose um, and began to form reefs. And that's the cool thing about studying the fossil record is that we can um, determine by when they first appear in the record of when things happen. Like when did the land first become colonized? When did um, plants that use spores to reproduce appear? When did seeds um, appear? When did flowers appear? Because we can find pollen. There's a whole study just called pollenology studying fossilized pollen. So, and there's even tra you know trace fossils. And these are leaves from plants from 300 million years ago that fell into the mud. That always amazes me that things like as delicate as that can be preserved. Um, like I said, you'll, you'll find um, ripple marks from a flowing stream 300 million years ago. And we'll see some of those photos too later today. But these are more plant and big kind of tree-like things, but there weren't um, trees yet. And even reptilians eventually um, appeared on the scene late in the Paleozoic to live and eat all the insects that were being um, 
that were evolving in those um, coal swamps. Um, so this is the view, this is probably the best view in Georgia in my mind. Um, this is from Fort Mountain. There's a wooden observation deck built overlooking the uh, Eastern Overthrust Fault and overlooking the Great Valley. So that's the Great Valley. It's a little hazy and you can't see this, you can barely see this ridge, but that's the other side of the valley basically. And we think, we being again a collective of geologists think that a big river once flowed through this valley and it no longer does, a much smaller river does today. And that big river was the Tennessee River. And it, one of its older forms and um, older courses. Um, so the Great Valley is underlain by um, limestone from the Cambrian. So 500 million year old um, sea life um, now makes up the um, ground of the Great Valley. I read somewhere that um, Almost every major battle in the history of man occurs on limestone terrain. And um, one of the reasons for that is that limestone terrain are usually fairly level if they're not karst, uh, like Puerto Rico we saw, but level like this. And you can you know, set out your army in the formation you want, and especially in earlier times, um, but like, Many of the great battles of the revolution, Saratoga we saw earlier in that Valley and Ridge uh, map, um, Chickamauga and Georgia were all fought on this limestone terrain. Even Gettysburg is on limestone terrain and Antietam and Shiloh. So here's this Tennessee River from the um, Lacefield book about Alabama geology, but there's a major um, gorge right in here that the Tennessee River took a lot of time to um, carve its way through. Um, and so we think that before it carved its way through that, this upper Tennessee River was flowing down through the Great Valley and into the Coosa River drainage basin. And it, even back in this day, the Atlantic Ocean was opening up because we're talking about 100 million years ago. And so it had found an outlet to the Atlantic Ocean, yet eventually the lower Tennessee will break through and, and by stream piracy, steal this upper part of the river and take it the course we know today. But um, the Tennessee River is a very, very complex river as you can see by the different routes that it took in that last map. Um, this is just my little attempt showing you the Tennessee um, drainage basin and then this older divide and this older route of the Tennessee River that it took through the Great Valley. And eventually it would go this way to the river, a very circuitous route. And water doesn't like to go a circuitous route. This is just the expl explanation of how they came up with um, this idea that the Tennessee River uh, was flowing s southward through the Great Valley and how the winding gorge eventually captured it. Um, again, this is a view from the um, Great Valley. This is actually a railroad embankment you can see, but this is Fort Mountain and maybe it's me, but I, I like to, go to places and, and because I like history, I like to place myself there when earlier things occurred, like say the Battle of Chickamauga. But in this case, I was thinking about, you know, um, in 1542, Hernando de Soto marched south out of Tennessee and through this valley. And I imagine what he saw here. And this was a really, really, high populated area of the world that he had discovered. Um, there were multiple uh, mound cities uh, along this fault line. 
And we all know of Etowah, but there are several others that were out here. And one of the bigger ones was called Coosa. And it was, um, it's why we call the Coosa River, the Coosa River. Well, it's why we call the site the Coosa probably, who knows what the Native Americans actually called any of these sites. Um, but the, I, I remember, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself somewhat, but I remember being at Etowah not too long ago and not for the first time, but what for the first time really thought about that Etowah was surrounded by this moat and a palisade and I wondered what well, was, were those defenses ever tested? So I asked a ranger and yes, indeed, it was tested by the people of Kusa. And in 1350, they conquered Etowah. And the re reason they know this is that when they were doing the archeology span at Etowah, well, at least they know that Etowah was sacked because they found a burn layer. And so the entire village of Etowah was burned in about 1350. And we think that was Kusa, partly because when DeSoto comes by here almost 200 years later, Kusa is the overlord of um, Etowah. And so not only goes to Kusa, but also to Etowah. And if you didn't know, everywhere DeSoto went, um, trouble surely followed. But he um, would kidnap the leaders of that city state and take them hostage. And then, you know, the trade off will give you back your ruler, but you have to give us all your food. And so that's how he was surviving. So this Eastern over and this um, juxtapositioning of ecosystems because of these faults and things or why people came to settle here. They would be able to utilize um, many more ecosystems to derive their living. Um, and this is just explaining that the sediments that underlay the um, valley and ridge are also mirrored in the rocks that are outcropping to the east of this fault as metamorphic rocks. Um, there are some rocks with those metamorphic rocks that are the bedrock beneath these sediments that have also been uplifted. So there's actually billion year old rocks in these mountains as well. And we'll see that in a um, map later. This is a view from the top of the mound at Etowah. And you can see how the Eastern overthrust curves around the site. The Etowah River is right in this tree line here. And uh, in the river are big rock weirs to funnel the fish so that you can capture them more easily to feed the masses of people that live here. Another view. And in some places you can faintly see the outline of mounds that have essentially been plowed under because not all of them were saved. There were many more mounds here than we see today. Um, these are those billion year old rocks. At one time we thought they were just um, restricted to this area of Red Top Mountain, but we've come to realize that the um, rocks at Fort Mountain are almost exactly like this and therefore probably the same rocks, um, these billion year old Corbin Nice. Um, so that was actually once a granite that intruded older sediments and metamorphosed them. And we know that that occurred a billion years ago. Um, but then um, that whole sequence of rocks, including the granite, were re-metamorphosed and turned into a gneiss. And one of the distinct characteristics of the Corbin gneiss are giant feldspar crystals. And that's what these white things are. And they've been elongated actually by the smearing of these rocks in that um, you know, like taffy pool, if you will. And my lens cap is for scale, but um, you can find big, big crystals like this, um, but in younger rocks um, in the Rottenwood Creek uh, Valley in the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. It's the um, a trail, I forget the man's name, Bob McCallahan or something like that, trail that goes right underneath I-75, 285 intersection. And you'll find rocks with even bigger crystals than this of feldspars. But this is a little island in Lake Alatoona on the way to um, Red Top Mountain. 
where these rocks outcrop. Um, they probably got exposed because of the wave action. Um, so this is the moat around Etowah. And, um, you know, as I said, that they were tested in 1350 um, and conquered, became a, a satellite of Kusa. These are the mounds at Etowah. Um, so the reason, again, that the people were coming to this area, the people who are hunter-gatherers um, know the landscape obviously much better than we do um, today, or in general that we do. And they recognize the ability to exploit multiple systems and how through time, i.e. the um, seasons, that you might want to, you know, um, be exploiting the um, resources of this one area during spring and this area during winter, et cetera. And so they try to settle in those areas. This is a map showing you the various mounds that you don't get to see anymore um, because they were plowed under. Um, and obviously to make all these mounds, as well as the palisade, they had to dig dirt from a borrow pit. And usually they would incorporate that into the moat itself. And that's probably what they did. But, and there's the fish weir. And you can still see this fish weir on the river. But so here are all the mounds. I've, I've, this was really just about Etowah. It, this is in the museum at Etowah, but I added a bunch of other little towns. Like this is Kusa, here's Nakuchi. Here, the um, Lower Creek Village of uh, Kawita, or yeah, Kawita, I think. Um, this is, um, there was a, a place called Ute or something, U-T-E, um, on the Upper Flint, um, Okmulgee on the Okmulgee River. There was Shoulder Bone and several other, um, and, and these names are the names that archeologists have given to the sites rather than what the sites were called by the Native Americans. Again, we have no idea. This is on the Oconee River. Um, and most of these sites are drowned underneath um, Lake Oconee, et cetera. And I wonder if sometimes that we didn't do that to kind of preserve them. Um, uh, Stallings Island is on the Savannah River and it was um, a different than these in that they weren't um, agriculturalists. They were just, um, gatherers and hunters um, and they were living off the shellfish of the river here and built big shell rings. Um, that's what you find down on the coast and then you find this one that's kind of an outlier of all the others. All the others seem to be very close to the boundaries between ecosystems, um, even the shell rings, yet Kolomoki is not and I, I think I mentioned before in our class that we were talking about the coastal plain about this unique environment that was in the area of Kolomoki that was so rich that they didn't need to really um, extensively farm and they could settle and build a temple mound village um, without, uh, they were farming, but they weren't farming the corn, beans and squash that we think all Indians farmed all the time. Um, it had not yet reached Georgia to, to farm corn and beans, they were farming some types of squash, pumpkins and things like that with sunflowers and other things that were called the Southern Agricultural Complex. So there was agriculture going on, but it wasn't the, as extensive as what they would be doing by the time Europeans would arrive, where there would be vast cornfields throughout the valley, that great valley. That's what DeSoto was going through um, on his horse. You know, and they had many hundreds of horses they also brought 600, well, they brought several pigs that turned into hundreds of pigs. And one of the things that really um, upset the Native Americans is they noticed that they, the Spaniards allowed their pigs to eat Native Americans, and then they would eat the pigs. And so the Native Americans of Georgia and Alabama, et cetera, thought the Spaniards were cannibals. So this is um, Lookout Mountain overlooking Chattanooga, and you can see what a, a um, 
commanding view you have from Lookout Mountain to think that in the Battle of um, Chattanooga in November of 1864, federal troops climbed up this cliff and took these cannons. I'm not sure how they did that. But ah, this is my painting behind me, but much better than my painting. This is my photograph of Cloudland Canyon. So you can see the cliffs that were these deltaic sands, the slopes where, that were those um, swamps that border a, a delta or within a delta, and then repeated. And what was happening just as at the Mississippi, and I know I've so, shown you um, a sequence of maps that show how um, rivers are really like taking a a hose, clamping it about three feet from its end, turning it on full blast so that it swings back and forth. And so that's what a river does as it empties into the ocean. It's flowing one way until the sediment that's dumped in front of it has blocked it and it needs to change its course. And so that's what you're seeing is this sequence was earlier and then the river went somewhere else and, and was flowing and this marsh appeared and then eventually the river swung back to this direction and put down another layer of delta sediments. And if you remember about isostases, as you put sediments on a landscape, it causes that landscape to depress. And so that's why it can build on top of each other over time. Um, that's good. Um, these are little pieces of sandstone on the top of the mountain. And uh, I'm not um, uncertain that these are actually, because these are massive. And by massive, I mean, there's no real internal structure to the sandstone here. And we'll, we'll see in a later photograph, um, the structure that most of the sandstone has in this um, area. Um, and this makes me think this is a flood that filled an older channel that was dry. Um, and then it solidified eventually over time to be this distinct, smaller, rounded um, rock that it's an actual stream channel preserved in rock. And here's some ripple marks. And I, I hope you can see them. There's one, another one, another one, another one. And so these are 300 million year old ripple marks. And in Glacier National Park, you can find one billion year old ripple marks in the Grinnell Formation. But this is the Crab Orchard Formation. And again, a, a view of Cloudland with its exit, the, the valley out here. And one of the characteristics of the ridge and valley um, province all the way from New York to uh, Alabama is that the mountains that we see now there are all synclines. The rocks actually slope like this. They dip into the mountain and the valleys are anticlines. And if you think about it in terms of uh, physics, when you have an anticline, you cause pressure to pull this you know, apart and erosion can act more easily on those anticlines than on the synclines where rocks are in compression their intention up here. And so uh, over hundreds of millions of years, that um, ac erosive action turns the anticlines into valleys and the synclines into the mountainsides. So this is one of the coolest rocks um, outcrops in Cloudland. This is just before you get to the stairs. And what you can see is this is cross bedded sandstone down here. So this was the daily flow of the of the river to the sea, um, depositing sand um, back and forth, back and forth, and then eventually um, it, it changed course and went another direction. And an oxbow lake, maybe you know, like maybe it bypassed a meander, and an oxbow lake formed. And then a big flood came and filled that oxbow lake with this massive sandstone i.e. it's massive because it's a one-time event where these are, uh, you know, multiple daily events going on and, and it all got preserved. And we know this actually curves around like an oxbow lake does to where the steps are. And that's, this is the steps going down. I call this the fish rock. To me, it looks like a catfish. Here's its eye, its whiskers 
that could be one of its whiskers. Anyway, it's that massive sandstone filling in that old oxbow lake that curves back around behind me to that outcrop of cross bedded sand. So you get um, an idea of the different um, deposits that were being made in this delta, you know, daily deposits of those cross bedded sands of the stream constantly changing course because it was braided um, to these big floods that would then fill up its features like oxbow lakes and channels, et cetera. And then they all got, um, they didn't get metamorphosed, but they got consolidated and they got consolidated because they were buried on top of, uh, buried beneath other things and that compressed them. Um, they never were buried deep enough to be metamorphosed though. So this is just sandstone and not quartzite. If it were metamorphosed, then it would be like the rocks at Tallulah Gorge. I like this one because you can see this body kind of sticking out of the rock face. And this is one of the waterfalls. And I think this is a channel bar that was, you know, preserved somewhat in the rock. That, you know, this was like if you went to Nancy Creek today, you would see piles of sand at all the little elbows of the of the creek. And that's where this channel bar would have formed and then got preserved. Um, during rainier times, there's more water coming out of the waterfall. And this boulder is not part of the stream deposit. This fell off the cliffs to the left or right and tumbled down here. Um, you know, not only is the canyon being um, excavated deeper by the water eroding deeper into the rocks, it's slowly getting wider too by erosion coming down the sides of the of the canyon and, and therefore will cause big boulders to roll down here. Again, you can see um, ripple marks in the um, rock outcrop. At, this is um, like the greatest of the overlooks of Cloudland. And I'm showing you now the synclinal form to the rocks that are beneath Lookout Mountain. And note how flat the top again is, as if this is another older erosional um, plateau. And that's exactly what it is. And one of the things that these mountains lend their use to us today are building what are called pump storage facilities. Um, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's the best kind of hydropower facility you can build. And we did build a small version of one of those in Georgia. And I'm not sure if I'd put that in here, but I'm gonna babble about it anyway. Um, it's called Rocky Mountain. And um, I got to do some work there because it was being sold by um, Georgia Power to Oglethorpe Power or vice versa. And so we had to do a, an assessment of it to make sure that they weren't buying hazardous materials in any way. Um, but so what they had done is taken a mountain north of Rome called Rocky Mountain that is a syncline. And so the top of the mountain is a, a bowl. And so they drilled a tunnel down the middle of the bowl and out the side of the mountain. And that's a... Um, Oh shoot, a funnel that they could use to then drop the water out of the synclinal lake at the top of the mountain to a hydropower plant on the side of it and generate power. But then they built a lake at the bottom of the mountain that was gonna surround the lake that that water falling out of the synclinal lake at the top would flow into so that at night, because hydropower is available 24 hours, but we really only use it 12 or 16 hours a day. So there's a time at night where there's power available that can't that isn't usually used. And they can use that power to pump the water back up to the top of the mountain and then let it fall the next day again. And these will increase the power um, production of a facility by double. And so that was a big thing to do at one time. And it's kind of petered off. And I think maybe there's other problems that they didn't foresee. Um, the one they built in Georgia is a much smaller version of the one they had originally planned. Um, one of the equivalent 
rocks in the metamorphosed area of Laurentia from that valley and ridge area where the sediments are is marble. Um, and that's obviously the metamorphosed equivalent of limestone. And there's a um, belt of marble that extends um, and basically 575 uh, follows that route. And it's called the Murphy Marble Belt for Murphy, North Carolina. Um, and that's where the Tate Marble, um, Georgia's big marble mines are located in the M Murphy Marble Belt. And the Indians of Etowah knew of this marble and knew to go and get it and they could carve into it. And um, they made these two effigy figures. Um, one is supposed to be a male, I think it's this guy, and this is the female, because uh, they kind of show that she has breasts. So they think she's the female and he's the male, although he looks like, like he has a mustache. Maybe I got that wrong. But anyway, um, these were burial um, effigies um, placed in the funerary offerings. Um, at the time, uh, Etowah was, we, I guess today archeologists think of Etowah at this time as being kind of like the Athens of the Native Americans of the Southeast. It was like where the greatest art was done was Etowah for some reason, both in um, copper and in figurines like this. And here's a raw piece of marble um, shown at a museum in Etowah area. This is actually the uh, Tate Quarry in, uh, on the, along the Murphy Belt. Um, and there are both quarries here and also mines because the, the mountains here are also underlain by this marble and they have dug into the mine. You can see the various steps. Um, and that's called raising a bench um, is this, they're you know cutting it into the blocks that they can transport because um, we can't transport very big blocks. Um, as you saw earlier, I was comparing the blocks of uh, at the Elberton granite quarry to the blocks in the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza. Um, so this, this little thing out here is something that's above the pump that's pumping the water out to keep the water low so they can keep mining this rock. So, and I told you there were mines as well as the quarry. And this is one of the mines underneath one of the mountains. Um, this is wide enough for two lanes of truck traffic to go in and big trucks. So now we're at Fort Mountain. Um, and this is at Corbin Nice again, but it's, um, yeah, we're 100 miles away from Red Top, well, maybe not that far, 80 miles away from Red Top Mountain. Um, but these rocks were once the basement below the um, sediments that are to the west of the um, Eastern Overthrust Fault. And they got thrust up with the uh, metamorphosed sediments that were on top of these that were on this eastern side of the fault. And there's a great structure that was built on Fort Mountain by the Native Americans that we don't really know what the structure is. Um, we call it Fort Mountain because of the structure, but it's clearly not a fort because it doesn't enclose anything. There's no drinking water with, above the um, structure. Um, the structure zigzags, is only about a thousand feet long and then ends, and it's all built on one uh, or on a relatively constricted contour line. It's built between, um, I forget, it's like 2870 and 2900 feet above sea level. So it, it's pretty much on the same level snaking up and down across this 900 to 1,000 feet. <clears throat> and I think that it's a snake effigy. Um, I've been to the um, Great Serpent Mound in Ohio, which is this uh, uncoiling snake that zigzags across. And at the very end, it's, it's eating an egg, whatever the, all that uh, symbiology means, I don't know. 
but I know that many ancient peoples revered snakes. Um, they could shed their skin, which seemed, you know, very interesting and maybe a, a renewal of life in a way <coughs> and things like that. But anyway, so I think this is a snake effigy too. And I think because it's built on the south slope of the mountain, if you cut down all the trees, it would have a commanding view of every sunrise and sunset, every moonrise and sunset, moonset throughout the year. I think it's an observatory. Um, we think that the one in Ohio is also an observatory. And I know they've measured some of the coils of the zigzags as aligning to places where the um, sun would rise in certain date or the moon would rise. <clears throat> and there are more dates in the calendar year than <clears throat> summer, winter solstice, or spring, fall equinox that are important, especially to agriculturalists. They want to know when the last frost is going to occur, when is the first frost going to occur, to know that we don't want to plant our crops until after that first frost or after that last frost, and we want to harvest them before that first frost. And so those happen to be about equidistance between the equinox and the solstices. And so there's usually eight different things that people can, or yeah, eight different time periods that people will measure uh, throughout the year. And we still celebrate many, you know, we certainly celebrate Christmas and New Year's around the winter solstice. Uh, Fourth of July is eh, kind of close to the summer solstice. But May Day is something we celebrate that's between the solstice and the equinox. Halloween is another one that's between a solstice and the equinox and about equal distance, both a May Day and Halloween. <clears throat> this shows you how zigzaggy is this trace of the um, serpent. And all these rocks are this ancient billion year old metamorphic Corbin nice. Um, another photo of that zigzaggy um, rock and how trees have grown up and it. There were these little um, internal structures within the wall that at one time they used to think they were like little uh, rendezvous places for lovers to, to sit close together or something, but more likely they're the positions to stand in to watch these uh, celestial observations my mind. Anyway, more of that. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to Fort Mountain, but it's well worth the, the day trip to go there to see the, um, from the overlook across the Great Valley to walk along. There, there is a trail that follows this um, uh, rock structure. Um, so you can get an idea of the amount of work it took to build this because it's colossal. Um, it is somewhat um, of an effort to walk up to here. Um, the path to the overlook is less arduous uh, from the parking lot uh, because this is actually above the observation. This rock wall is actually above the observation deck. And so you, if you go to here, you have to walk up to it and then you can go down to the observation deck, but you can also go straight to the observation neck and then walk up to here and then back down to the park. Um, but again, you can easily get out to the observation deck, I think, um, and see that view. Um, and on the way there, you might go through um, Georgia 48, east of Somerville, and see this out top of Cambrian Dolomite. I um, googled Earth and put myself in the street there um, just the other day, and they're working in this area. And I, I saw there was um, constructing a bypass around Somerville. And it um, I'm kind of afraid that they've torn up this area and you no longer can see it. <clears throat> One of the cool things I like about it is all the colors in it. You can see somewhat purple and the yellowish gold, white. Um, you'll see red. And obviously those are mineral stains from the different minerals that are in the limestone from iron. This is limonite type iron, the more purplish reddish is the ferric iron that we know of and these 
clefts that are eroding are deep enough that I can hide in one. That's me, as you can see. But really cool fluting from the erosion, water pouring off that upper ledge and carving the dolomitic limestone here. Um, and this dolomitic limestone is um, 500 million years old. Um, this is just a little like inclusion within this purple area of limestone. And, you know, it's more like the limonite and I'm not sure if it broke off and, or what, how it came to be within this matrix. It's something different and a typical view um, in the Valley and Ridge. Um, one of the things you can see way off in the distance here, that's the edge of Lookout Mountain where we were standing by that cannon looking over Chattanooga. And that's how far away. And so th this is another series of valleys and ridge and I'm on top of a ridge obviously too. Um, one of the cool things that is little known is that Pigeon Mountain is one of these mountains in the Valley and Ridge and inside Pigeon Mountain is a cave. And in that cave are two vertical shafts that are the second and third deepest shafts in North in the United States, lower 48 states in a cave. Um, one is over 550 feet straight down and the other is 450 feet straight down. And I push to put a photo of that in here because um, National Geographic um, set up ropes and rappelled down those two vertical shafts and had climbers on the rope at intervals with lamps on so you could illuminate the entire shaft. And it kind of looks like a keyhole, how it has a roundedness to it, but with one side incised, like you would put a key in it. And that's where the waterfall incised into the edge. But it was all made by a waterfall in there and is amazing. I'm gonna put that in next week. Um, this shows you a gap. Um, and what happened throughout the Valley and Ridge, much like I've talked about with the Chattahoochee River and sizing its course into the surrounding rocks, the streams that flow through this area were flowing before they incised themselves into this landscape. And so in places, the stream just cut right through an older ridge over time. And we now call those gaps or notches or a pass. Um, <laughs> this is I-59 in the northwest corner of Georgia. And this is um, Mississippian limestone. And one of the cool things, and we're going to see it in a better photo, but um, you see these massive layers of limestone. Um, and it's a fossiliferous. I haven't found very many fossils here, usually because the vegetation is so thick that I, when I've been there that I didn't want to really dig around in there, at least a snake get me. But um, th these rocks were laid down, buried, um, uplifted, exposed, and in uplifting them, they got faulted. And so that um, this is the thrust vault that these rocks over here have been lifted and placed on top of these rocks over here. Not that these have actually moved this way, but the relative movement between the two across the fault is like that. And this all occurred just 265 million years ago when Africa and Europe collided with North America. These are um, outcrops again on I-59, and this is not Mississippian, but Ordovician limestone. And I have been able to find crinoid stems and um, horn coral and things like that in the fossils on these outcrops. This is one of the one areas we could go and look for fossils, but it's you know a two hour drive away. How would we all get there? Um, there's only so much room. It's not real safe to park on the side of an interstate. Um, there are lots of factors that come in. More of the Ordovician um, limestones in this area. And that's it. Okay, another incredible hour with Chuck. And we already have David with his hey, hand. Flatterer. <laughs> yes, Dave.
Oh, I noticed early on at the beginning when you were showing the geology of the Ukra of Ukraine. Uh, I know it's four times as large as the state of Georgia, approximately. But I noticed the parallel situation with your uh, comments about the state of Georgia having so many different types of geological strata and history of geology throughout the state. As small as it is, it has, you know, from all the different st stratas that we've been studying, Ukraine has them too. Yeah, well, they have certainly the ones through the um, Paleozoic um, and yeah. older. Um, yeah. I, I don't know enough about their geology to know if they have like what we have on the coastal plain from right. the Cretaceous forward. But anyway, it, just, sense. it reminded me. It was an observation of just reminding me of the parallelness. Yeah. Okay. And, and one time I thought we were really special. And <laughs> over time, I've come to realize, no, it's just that, well, and we are kind of special in that we have those time periods represented by rocks that are on the ground surface. M many places have those rocks, but they're not you know, visible to them. They're deeper under the ground surface. So, but most of the East Coast has what Georgia has, at least up until Virginia, Maryland, and around Alabama and such. Folks, you can turn your videos on. Chuck likes to see us, especially if he gives us a chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Margita. Yes, uh, I was intrigued by those ripple marks on uh, the various rock formations you showed us. And I just don't understand, why did they not erase over time? They, they got quickly buried by other sand bodies and preserved. You know, that's all that happens. Um, if you have a place that is rapidly sinking, you'll have better prospects of preserving things like ripple marks and fossils and things like that. And a delta is a place where the there's so much sediment coming down and being placed in one place, it, that weight is pressing down, causing the ground underneath it to sink. And so um, that helps preserve things like ripple marks and fossils. <laughs> Otherwise, is it not a, a catastrophic event necessary for that? Just no, it's oh, like okay. your daily flow. Okay. Being Thank preserved. Um, we can even find things in the fossil record like um, mud cracks. You know, that a uh, lake bed dried up and mud cracks formed, and then sediment came and filled in those mud cracks and preserved them. Uh, we find things like burrows of animals that will like crabs will burrow into the sand on the beach. And we can find those because, you know, sometimes it's something catastrophic, like a volcano went off and dumped um, ash or lava to fill in those things. But many times it's just the sediment itself refilling it and having a slightly different color for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Sure. Willis? Uh, Chuck, you clarified something I'd been wondering about all along. Uh, your lens cap in various places as perspective, <laughs> that, that was helpful. I, it verified what I thought. The other thing is I wish your cursor was larger so we could see follow it easier on the slides. Okay. I it's possible next time or not. I'll see if I can make it bigger. Um, I was taught early on, I think that's one of the things geologists teach each other is that you always need a um, scale. You know, if you're taking a professional picture of fossil or a mineral, you'll generally have a little bar underneath marked off in like centimeters or something. And usually centimeters because the rest of the world speaks in centimeters and meters and not in inches and feet. Um, as, as a matter of fact, I think there are only three countries in the world that use the system we use. Um, everyone else in the world uses the metric system. And I know Carter tried to get us to go to the metric system and we kicked and brayed so loudly that we didn't go there. But um, um, a lens cap works perfectly. Uh, I'll use a, um, 
my wallet sometimes or a money clip if I don't have a lens cap available. Chuck's lens cap is like Flat Stanley. People with kids and grandkids will remember that. A Flat Stanley that was sent all over the world and appeared at different places and yes. everything. So, <laughs> Unfortunately, I've nobody... lost that lens cap. I had to get a new one. <laughs> Super. Sure. Do we have um, other comments or questions? I was just going to make a comment that next week I'm going to try to convince you that everything we do is about geology. <laughs> I believe it. Okay, well, let's ask everyone to unmute so we can thank Chuck for another incredible performance. Thank you, thank Chuck. You. Delightful as always. Very thank informative. You. Thank you. You guys are delightful. Thank so you. So are you. you. <laughs> I hope to see you in person soon. Okay. And we're going to need some volunteers to kidnap Chuck next week so that he can continue. Uh, well, I will be next Friday. Hey, George. Uh -huh. George, is there any possibility we could get uh, uh, this recording? Yes, I was thinking the same thing, and I'm going to suggest that we send that out because this is so incredible. And I think there's a lot of people who haven't been tuning in to see what they've been missing, but there's so yeah, many. Well, I think, uh, Sal would love this about the Indians. Right. And, uh, yes. There are many people that are, are missing out all this good stuff. I know. I was just um, noticing a comment in chat where somebody was saying, could you send out the names of the parks that you visited so we can go there sometime? And I guess they're talking about the state parks in Georgia. I've been to every single one of the state parks in Georgia, but the uh, ones with great geology are like Cloudland Canyon, um, Tallulah Gorge, Providence Canyon, um, Stone Mountain, uh, Panola don't, Mountain, don't forget, et cetera. Don't forget Oak Mulgee, and that's national. Yeah, Oak Mulgee, Cumberland <laughs> Island, um, even places like Fort Pulaski, you can see, you know, the um, sediments and things that make up the marshes along the Savannah River there and things like that. Um, as far as national parks across the lower 48, there are only um, four or five national, I think five national parks I have not been to in the lower 48 and one national seashore. I've been to every other national park, every national seashore and lake shore in the lower 48. And I plan to do those six parts over this year, I hope. I had planned to do them in 2020, but we all know what happened in 2020. <laughs> hey, you do it very well by Zoom, thank you very much. Yes, you know, you. I should just film myself at these parks and just run yes. those as a, a try. <laughs> Chuck, I thought of a way that you could retire. You need to get on Jeopardy, a geology Jeopardy. You could <laughs> definitely win that. Yes. And, uh, Probably not. <laughs> but thank Chuck, you for thanking such. Chuck, did you go to Shambly High School by chance? I did go to Shambly High School. Okay, because Judy's yeah, sister when and she graduated. When did you graduate? 75. I was there from 70 to 75. Okay. 70, yeah. They live up by Lookout Mountain, so we wanted to. They went to Shambly? No, they were teachers, but you're too young to have had them, so. Oh, okay. Then they I'm moved. too young. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, my brother was there until 68 to 73. The chit chat is amazing. <laughs> My sister taught Latin. Did you take Latin? I did not. Okay. I took Spanish. Um, Como esta? Muy bien, gracias. You usted? Oh. <laughs> I, luckily, my phone does that now. <laughs> it's like, I think I've told you before, the only uh, 
real French I knew when I was 21 and backpacking through Europe was Ule de Gar. Where's the where's the station? And luckily people would point and then rattle off something in French about how many turns you would go and whatever. And we'd go to the next intersection and go, Ule de Gar. And luckily they'd point <laughs> and then rattle off something in French. And we'd eventually get there. We were when not in, in Germany. Hurry. When I was in Germany for a couple of years in the army, I had to just learn a lot of little things in German, like Voest de Bahnhof, which is very similar to what you said, because that's where's the railroad station. Yeah. That was when I was walking around and doing stuff. And foot and inches. Okay, let's go back to foot and inches real quick, Chuck. Uh, for about two or three years in my architectural profession, are you still there? I yeah. am there. Um, I did Middle East work. Saudi Arabia and Iran before the revolution. And all the architectural drawings that I worked on was in, uh, um, in the metric system. So it was ingrained in my head there for a, a few years. And I often wondered why in the world we're not there. Yeah, and it, it's weird because in school, when you're taking physics and things like that, you're always in the metric system. So we know it. and. Yeah, and it's much easier. It's a base 10. Yeah. I mean, 